Hello and welcome to our special edition podcast in which we are going to address some of the myths around Jeremy's case and answer some of the frequently asked questions. My name is Yvonne Hartley and I'm co-administrator of the Jeremy Bamber Innocence Campaign. I also act as Forensic Liaison Manager and I liaise between Jeremy and the legal team and assist them with the legal work and the recent submissions to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. I am joined today all the way from Jersey by our social media wizard, Heidi Hawkins. Hello, Heidi. Hello, Yvonne. It's nice to speak to you today. Um, it's lovely yes, to speak uh, to my, you. My, ro- my role is, in fact, um, looking after Twitter and um, speaking to people on Twitter, in fact, with many, many questions that they have. Um, I also do um, various other jobs that I'm asked to do, like pre- proofreading and things like that. But the main job that I have is to get the information that we have out into the the general public so that everybody knows what's going on. If they're interested in the case, they have daily updates about what's happening, what's happened in the past, so that um, people are aware um, of what what Jeremy's case is all about. And um, particularly at the moment, so important with the Criminal Cases Review Commission situation that we have at the moment. The other thing I do is um, look after the petition that we have which has been signed by many people. Um, the comment, comments that are on there are very, very interesting. I'd certainly encourage anybody to sign it. It's on our webpage, on the front page. And um, of course, this is for the information that um, is still being withheld by Essex Police. Unbelievably, after 35 years, they're still withholding evidence, which is quite incredible for any case. So that's basically what I'm doing for the for the Excellent. Thank okay. you very much, Heidi, for that insight into your very extensive work within the campaign. Very important work. So today, as I say, we're going to answer some of the frequently asked questions and some of the myths. So we will begin with, and Heidi will start, which one we're doing third. Oh, you, do you want to ask the question? I'll ask the question. Yes, uh, many, many people. Yeah. I've asked many, many various questions and they're all very interesting and they are bothering people as they wouldn't ask those questions. So we've come up with a set for today. And um, so I'll be asking the questions and Yvonne, you can be answering them for us. Well, thank you very much. Right, so what's the, th- what's the first most popular myth then, Heidi, please? Well, the first question is, so what was Jeremy really like? Is he arrogant and cocky as portrayed by... Freddie Fox in the recent White House farm drama. Is that true? Is he really that bad? <laughs> Absolutely not. I think mean, Freddie Fox portrayed a character that he'd assembled from snippets from books, snippets from uh, news footage of Jeremy. He had no interest whatsoever in meeting Jeremy. Uh, he never even applied to go and see him. He's never spoken to him. He's never spoken to any of Jeremy's friends. So the character created by Freddie Fox was a character. It wasn't based on Jeremy at all. So he was portrayed to be cocky and arrogant. And I suppose in some ways it could be defined as such in the way that Jeremy's attitude was towards certain police officers later on in the investigation, particularly DS Jones. That's only because... D.S. Jones was con- constantly antagonising Jeremy. So certainly Jeremy had a little bit of an attitude with certainly one police officer in the case, who was D.S. Stan Jones. Well, that's for the simple reason that from the outset, Jeremy had just been told his family had died and Stan Jones said, oh, well, you've got to get used to it then. All your family's dead, get on with it. It's like, really, for a 24-year-old? So Jeremy took an instant dislike to Stan Jones and coincidentally it was Stan Jones who conducted the majority of Jeremy's interviews and it was Stan Jones who we've later found out gave evidence that he was looking for anything to arrest Bamba for. So that's the attitude of Stan Jones so it's no wonder Jeremy had a little bit of an attitude back towards him. But I've known Jeremy a long time now and I've always found him a very kind and caring person. Um, he's more concerned with how 
his friends and supporters and campaign team are than how his self is. We do get a lot of negative news. We get a lot of the negative media. We've had some um, results in the case that we haven't necessarily thought we were going to get. There have been negative results and we thought we'd get a positive outcome. But Jeremy's first concern is how we are, not how he's reacted to this negative news. So I think that you know, sums up that he isn't the arrogant, cocky person that he's been depicted to be at all. No, that's not the impression that I've ever had of Jeremy. Um, I've had many phone calls and spoken to him and I've never come across that attitude in him at all. That doesn't mean to say that when he was younger, I mean, we must remember he was only 24 at the time that he was arrested. And um, I'd imagine that if you, you, you're innocent, you're going to go, well, I haven't done it. You know, that's, that's the sort of thing, the attitude you're going to have. You're not going to perhaps be on your best behaviour had you done it. So in my opinion, he was still very young. And, you know, and, and I, we have to put that into perspective of the time as well. 1985 is going back a long time. Attitudes were very different back then. And it was yes, sir, no, sir, to the police. You certainly didn't answer them back. So if he was attempting to stick up for himself and getting a bit fed up with being asked questions. You know, the, the case is going to be, well, of course I haven't done it. Don't be so ridiculous, you know. But um, no, I, I can say that really Freddie Fox did his best. He's a very good actor, but he wasn't accurate. And that's the sad part about it, really. Perhaps he'd gone into this a little bit more and got into the character of what Jeremy's really like. It would have come across very, very differently to the way he portrayed him. And I Absolutely. think he missed a trick there. Absolutely. And I don't think the media have ever helped either because... You know, they've, they've shown like a photograph of Jeremy coming out of the court smiling and it's like, you know, smiling, bamba, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, but Jeremy was smiling at friends and we were across the road. They don't really? tell you that. He's just made out to look like he's smirking at the legal system where it wasn't that at all. He had friends across the road who was greeting and letting know he was all right. But that's interpreted as, oh, the smile of a killer. So. You know, it's been complete mis in misinterpretation. And it's like at the trial, I think there was 14 of Jeremy's friends who've given character statements about him, and not one of them was disclosed to the defence. Not one of them was produced at trial. It was just a complete character assassination of somebody who didn't warrant it. So, in fact, so, it's very biased um, towards the prosecution, in actual fact, because if you're not seeing both sides of the person's character you're not getting the full picture exactly which is very unfair and shouldn't really be happening at a trial and um you know unless unless you meet the person you're not really going to know what they like anyway and then you can make up your own mind about them exactly you don't talk, you talk about our personal experiences and as you said when character witnesses when people actually wrote things about jeremy because they knew him and in fact we have and it's interesting um, that some of the people who Jeremy knew before, even before the tragedies at Warehouse Farm, from being young, from being very young, mm -hmm. these people are still in touch with Jeremy now. Which yeah. are they going to be in touch with somebody who was cocky and arrogant and who they believe to be a murderer? No, they're not. You know, yeah. Jeremy is completely innocent. He is not the character he's been portrayed to be. And these people have stuck by him. You know, in some cases, 50 years. It's enough for me with a very young child and these people have kept in touch. So well, I think that it. speaks a lot of the true character of Jeremy. It definitely does. It speaks volumes, really. To have people stick by you all this time and believe in you and um, to keep his friends for that length of time as well, which uh, is, is the absolute characteristic of somebody who's not a psychopath, interestingly. The psychopaths think of people as being very disposable and Jeremy's not like that. Um, no, not at all. Jeremy's very loyal to his friends and very loyal to his supporters. And like I say, his first concern on a daily basis is how is everybody? The you know, question, somebody's unwell or... You know, the other question that comes up is, did Jeremy hate his sister and parents? Not at all, no. No, Jeremy loved his mum and dad. I mean, you know, his world revolved around his parents when he was growing up. I mean, I know he went to boarding school but he didn't harbour any resentment for that. 
Um, he would go out walking in the fields with his dad at night, looking at the stars, helping him on the farm. And he absolutely loved his parents. He could walk with his mum, looking in the hedgerows, finding out what all the butterflies and the little animals were called. You know, very simplistic life, really, but, you know, one where Jeremy always felt loved and wanted and needed, and he loved his parents to bits. His relationship with Sheila, they had the child quibbles like you do any brother and sister relationship. Quite but, natural feeling. Well, absolutely, you know, a little bit of, you know, taunting and teasing each other, but he absolutely loved Sheila. I mean, she used to have him in her, when she had her apartment in London, where, before she married Colin, and even after she married Colin, she always wanted Jeremy involved in their lives. He would go and stay there. She, she'd like show, take him to a nightclub. She'd show him around London. She'd involve him in her life. And they absolutely loved each other. In actual fact, it looked like Jeremy was quite protective of his sister. Absolutely. And Jeremy said to me often that, you know, he wishes he'd known more about her condition then and that there would be more he could have then done to help her um he always feels bad that he didn't know more about her condition but we're talking about the 80s and mental health was absolutely brushed under the carpet in the 80s it was a taboo subject he didn't talk about it any disability in the 80s was you know sort of kept quiet people weren't as outspoken as they are now it wasn't a day-to-day -day part of conversation it was very much you know, oh, shh. You no, know, I used to, you've heard tales of people in the family like, oh, just they're not well, you know, to cover up mental health issues and everything. And it was something that I suppose to some people was an embarrassment maybe at that time and a lack of understanding, which, which led to a naivety about the condition and the, the effects that these devastating illnesses can have on people and their families. Yes, indeed, because I think with schizophrenia, um, it was something it wasn't spoken about. It wasn't understood. And, and of course, it's something that would have been brushed under the carpet and, and hidden from people. They wouldn't just want to discuss a problem in the family like that. Exactly. Certainly, and I think as well, the lack of, I mean, there was no internet. You know, we're going back pre, like everybody having the World Wide Web. And it's like, you know, the, the information wasn't there. So the no, information no. For, the, for the person who's suffering of the illness and their family members and friends just wasn't as available as what it is now. You can go on mm. Google now and look up schizophrenia and get thousands and thousands of pages where you can read to get a knowledge of the, the illness, but you couldn't in 1985. No. You couldn't in very... 1983 when Sheila was first diagnosed. It's very much covered up. Um, very much so. Um, so you can imagine, as you said, you, you could go on the internet now and look it up and you could ask questions. In actual fact, going back into 1985 and certainly when I was growing up, um, you, you didn't ask questions of the doctor like you do now. You just not accepted so what you were told and you did not um, query what they were saying because you could actually get it ticking off if you just start asking too many questions and disagreeing with them nowadays, so I don't think a younger population realise how strict it was and how different it was. You know, you did whatever the doctor told you. You know, if you saw a specialist, it would be the same, even more so with a specialist. You'd really look at the of a yes, sir, no, sir situation. So you accepted what was um, provided to you. You saw maybe your, your doctor every now and again. And um, the relationship was a very different one to what people would have today. And so therefore, schizophrenia certainly back then wasn't particularly well known. Um, some, of, some of the electrical treatment that they used, therapy. Oh, horrendous. You know, pretty shocking. And um, so this, this is something that you perhaps don't see nowadays in the UK, whereas years ago it was accepted that a patient would receive that treatment. And I bet a lot of the younger generation don't even know anything about that treatment because it's just something that's that's not now spoken about. No. You know, everything's, like everything's far more advanced in 35 years than what it was, you know, that in, in the time when it applied to Sheila. Absolutely. And nobody in the family um, would have expected her to do what she did. 
which was all the evidence points to the fact that she was in a bad way when she came out of the hospital medication had been reduced dramatically she was due another dose and of course this was set off a psychotic episode absolutely so but it it's a perfect storm going back to jeremy and sheila's relationship it's noticeable that on the party on the weekend before um the tragedies that colin was having and when he introduced his new girlfriend sheila um she was absolutely distraught she sat quietly, and who was it who looked after her and took her home? Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Who was it when she put her hand through a window in sheer frustration and took her to the hospital? Jeremy. So, you know, he was always there as much as he could be and as much as he understood about her illness. So it's completely wrong for people to say that he had a hatred of his parents or his sister. Completely wrong. No, this is a very very caring, hardworking son, because he did work very hard on the farm, as has been witnessed um, by people who are actually the caravan site. You know, he got on with his job. Now, the Absolutely. next question that I have, which is a very interesting one here. Oh, dear. Um, did, Jeremy wear, uh, did Jeremy wear makeup and dress up like Adamant, who's very popular and one of my favourites? <laughs> I, I loved it. Oh, here. I've heard this. Yes, people say that Jeremy was driving the tractor with his fully shirt on, dressed like Adamant, and with all his makeup on. <laughs> no, no, it's not true. <laughs> Jeremy wore jeans and a top, and usually a boiler suit or a coverall while he was working on the farm. I mean, you know, a fully shirt would get not very um, practical for <laughs> driving a tractor, is it? And it's not the sort of thing Jeremy would wear when he went out, Jeremy would wear. Uh, shirt and trousers or you know jeans and a top depending upon where he was going as for wearing makeup <laughs> yeah exactly well. uh, it's very acceptable no. when we were growing up it was the new thing the in fact that kids were dressing up and emulating pop stars they wanted to be like them they wanted to be a part of what was going on at that stage so it did happen it doesn't make you a murderer <laughs> it did happen but Jeremy <laughs> didn't dress like adamant um, he didn't even like other man, so um, he didn't no, he just dressed. <laughs> if he was going somewhere smart for a meal or something, it was or a, a, a nice club, you know, uh, trousers and shirt. And if he was going just to the lo down the local pub or going to work, it would be jeans. So, and as for right. wearing makeup, I'd like to ask I bet there's not many people who were teenagers or young adults in the 80s, males who didn't wear a little bit of eyeliner or, you know, a little bit of trying to look after the complexion. You know, I, it was very common. When I was 18 in 1985, and I remember that when I'd been at school, uh, a couple of years before that, that when I went for an eyeliner at my local chemist shop, they never had any because the lads had bought them all. So, you know, it was like popular. It was like, I, I don't see what's wrong with it if he did occasionally wear a bit of eyeliner if you know i know i know it's quite in the 80s who, who used to wear foundation because mm. you know they had spotty skin and they wanted to be a foundation to make them look healthy i mean i wouldn't have thought jeremy for a minute i mean he's outside all day in the weather on the farm getting a very healthy complexion anyway so you know no completely no well i've got an even better question for you oh dear well, the next one. It's been reported that Jeremy went on expensive holiday to the south of France, where he indulged in sex, drink and drugs. Is that true? He did go on a holiday to the south of France, yes. That's about where the truthfulness ends. So after he's been questioned for the first time by the police, he was, he was charged for the burglary at the caravan park. And then he was released. So he was released without charge for the incident at White House Farm. So after a few days, Brett Collins suggested to him, look, the media's everywhere. When your head's all over the place with these interviews, well, let's go away. Let's have a few days away. So they decided to go to San Tropez, they went on the ferry. So when they got there, they got an 80 quid caravan, a six berth caravan. It was 80 pounds because it was the end of the season. So they got it cheap. So, and then I've asked Jeremy about this. I said, so, all right then, so were you going 
gallivanting off nightclub him, meeting women. What? He, no. He said he hardly saw Brett. Brett was out nearly every night, nearly all the time. Jeremy would go for walks along the beach, go for walks. Uh, he did meet people, he did socialise with people, but it certainly wasn't 10 days of sex, drugs and rock and roll. No. Um, and then obviously... Yeah. Well, it was, because Jeremy's not that character. I mean, he's a very friendly person. And I should imagine if somebody came to talk to him, he'd talk to them, you know, he wouldn't... I mean, I know he made some friendships, but it wasn't like... It wasn't like... Fifty Shades of Grey weekend or anything like that, certainly not. No, it's good to know what really happened because, um, again, people are forming a character, a person, so if they get the wrong information, they're going to... And I think as well, when people think of Sam Trapeer, they're thinking, like, you know, expensive and brushing the cash around and anything like that. He was £80 for 10 days for two people. So, you know... It, well, it wasn't expensive, the big expensive flash holiday people. No, think nothing it was. like. No, I think he's entitled to have a break as well after going through the things that he had. And so, unfortunately, that's where we will have to leave it today. My thanks to Heidi for joining us and for helping to answer some of the questions and address some of the myths that exist in Jeremy's case. In our next special episode, we will discuss the dogs at White House Farm and give you the actual facts, as well as discussing evidence regarding the wetsuit that Jeremy was supposedly meant to wear and resolving the issue of the nude photographs that Jeremy supposedly was trying to sell the Sun newspaper. And we'll address one other very important question, which is, is Jeremy Bamber a psychopath? Find out in the next episode. Until then, Bye-bye.